It is February, my friends. I have some rain coming down on my face right now. It's almost whispering to me that the season is almost here. So in today's video, not only myself and not only Jacques the Garden Hermit, but three other growers are gonna give you their favorite things to start right now. So San Diego recommendations, recommendations from the UK, from North Carolina, from the Pacific Northwest, we're coming at you hot and let's figure out what to plant. It's finally, finally time to start seeds indoors for one of my all-time favorite things to grow. Now, I want you to imagine a cherry tomato and a tomatillo. They fall in love and they have a baby. And what they create is this wonderful and delicious little fruit called the ground cherry. Ground cherries are actually a native husk fruit to the Americas, and they go by a ton of different names depending on where you live. I've always called them ground cherries, but I've heard them called Cape gooseberries, husk cherries, golden berries, and there's many more names, but their scientific name is actually Fasalis, and they're in the same family as tomato and tomatillos. Although they're related to tomatoes, they actually taste nothing like their cousins. The best way I can describe their flavor is incredibly sweet, like candy. I actually call these my garden candy. And if you get a variety like this pineapple variety, it has the most lovely hint of pineapple and mango. So they're so delicious. They're great for fresh eating. If you see me out in the garden in the summertime, most likely I've got a mouthful of ground cherries, but their flavor also pairs really well with warm flavors like vanilla, cinnamon, cloves. So they make excellent jams. And there's this summer delicacy that I make every year that I'm so excited to make again. And it's my ground cherry upside down cake. It is so good. You wanna start these seeds indoors or in a greenhouse if you have one, and you wanna grow these just like you would tomatoes. So they like to be started in a seed tray and then up potted as they grow bigger and then finally transplant it out into the garden after your last frost. And these plants can get pretty massive. They have this sprawly bush-like growing habit. They grow very low to the ground. That's why they're called ground cherries. And also their fruit, as it ripens, it falls to the ground just like with tomatillos. And they're pretty hardy plants. And since they're native, a lot of people have success growing them in ground. But you have to be careful with that because they can get pretty invasive. So what I like to do is I like to grow them in grow bags. It just kind of makes them a lot easier to control and it makes harvesting a lot easier as well. If it wasn't for this next plant, I don't even know if I would be gardening today because it is an absolute staple in my garden and every year I grow a little bit more. Something I grew up eating with my parents from their garden fresh every single summertime. And that of course is the humble tomato. They come in many different shapes and forms. Today I chose three of them to share with you guys, including one that's new to me, which is the cream sausage bush slash determinant tomato. Now with a determinant tomato, you generally probably want to grow a lot of them because they're great for processing into things like salsas and sauces. So I'm going to be starting six of these and filling up this whole bed with just them. But I have two other favorite tomatoes that I grow every single season. If I had to choose a single cherry tomato to grow for the rest of my life, it is always going to be the Sun Gold. They're sweet, they're tart, they have complexity in their flavor. Everyone who has ever tried them, it immediately becomes their favorite. In terms of beefsteaks, I like Cherokee Purple, or in this case, Cherokee Carbon, which is actually a hybrid version of the Cherokee Purple. They're a little easier to grow, more reliable, more disease resistant, so it makes it a little bit more friendly to grow in any garden. Now, when it comes to starting your seeds indoors, that's step one. Step two is figuring out where the heck you're gonna put them. So here's a little tip for growing tomatoes. If you're growing beefsteaks like the Cherokee Carbon, the bigger the fruit, the more sun they need. So if I were to plant both these tomatoes here, I would put the Cherokee Carbon up front where it gets full sunlight. It might cast a little bit of a shadow to the back, which is where I would put the Sun Gold because they don't need quite as much sun to still reliably fruit. With these two, you have a flavor guarantee that they're probably going to be the top tomatoes in your garden year after year. One plant I'm going to be sowing this month is everyone's favorite emoji, something I know as the aubergine, but I'm sure a lot of you will call them eggplants. Aubergines are a lot slower to grow than their close relatives, tomatoes and peppers, which is why I'm starting them off nice and early. Sowing these now will give them a longer time to grow to ensure I can get a good harvest. I'm sowing three varieties because I can never just grow one variety of anything, even though I have a tiny garden. I've got this pinstripe one, which is quite compact, so great for a small space. I've got an early white variety, which is good if you have a short growing season, and this dark round one, which is supposed to have the best flavor. I'm just sowing the seeds individually into a module tray, which I filled with pre-watered seed compost. The ideal temperature for aubergines to germinate is 24 to 32 degrees Celsius or around 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So I'm gonna be placing mine indoors on a heat mat until I see some leaves pop out of the soil. I'm getting seeds started for my wellness garden, which is going to have tea, medicinal, and dyer's bed in this circle of awesomeness that you see here. Giving these plants a head start is super important in my climate because the slugs really go crazy early on in the season. So getting them to a good strong size really gives them the best chance of surviving. The first one is kind of a weird one for me because I really hate the taste of black licorice, but when you use the leaves for tea or even as part of a salad, it really adds a cool unexpected taste. And that's the anise hyssop, also known as lavender hyssop or licorice mint. These plants are native to North America and are perennials in zones four through eight. They have beautiful lavender blue spiked flowers that bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds love. It's really important when you're planting out seeds that you pre-moisten the soil. And that just means that when you are prepping your soil, add water to it before putting it in the seed trays. That really helps speed up the germination process because you have a nice moist environment for the seeds to germinate in. And it also helps not displace the seeds if you're watering from above. Now, it also helps with the level of the soil. If you use dry soil, once you plant the seeds and then water it, you'll notice that the level goes down. So when you start with the pre-moistened soil, you know exactly how much dirt you're going to be using. And you don't need a ton of these seeds. They're going to make a lot of plants. These germinate really, really well. So give your extra starts away and keep in mind that this is part of the mint family. So when you are ready to plant them out, you're gonna to wanna to rain them in by planting them out in pots. The anise hyssop seeds benefit from cold stratification, which means they need a period of damp cold to germinate well. And I've pre-prepped these seeds and had them stratifying for about a month in my refrigerator. Now you don't have to do this, but it can help with seeds like this and the seed packet itself will make a note if stratification is an option. So when you're planting these out, these are tiny little seeds and they're gonna need light to germinate. So you're gonna wanna sprinkle the seeds in a seed flat like this. And then you're gonna wanna tamper them down using a block, using your hand, something so that the seed itself has contact with the soil. Megan Lloyd here, coming to you live from North Carolina, where we have tornado watches later this week. And I'm trying to film for epic gardening. It seems that today is not gonna be the day. Back to you, Kevin. Welcome, my friends, to the Epic Shed. Very cozy here in the rain. For my first selection, this would be a plant that I think everyone has to grow, but some people are obsessed with growing, and I'm starting to put myself in that later category. It is one with endless variety. It is one that can be eaten dried, fresh, preserved, pickled, jammed, jellied, and this of course would be the vast world of peppers. In true epic fashion, I don't have one pepper for you. I have three, and I'm gonna start off with what seems like a basic choice, but I do not think it is, especially if you have a short, short season. This is a 63 day to maturity jalapeno. It is an early jalapeno. The name is really all you need to know about it. The rest of the characteristics of the plant are basically going to be the same, but if you have a short season and you wanna start something now and just get it in the ground and have basically jalapenos for two months, then this is the one to go with. Now, the next one is a new one for me this season. I had a ton of like smashing success with Thai chilies. This is effectively the Japanese version of a Thai chili. Not exactly the same, but very close. It's called Santaka, 40 to 50,000 Scoville units. So quite a bit hotter than the 5,000 Scoville unit jalapeno that I just mentioned. But if you like to dry your chilies, this is one that I really recommend. And then for you sweet, sweet sweeties out there, the Jimmy Nardello. This is one that came over to America, I think in 1887, by the Nardello family, 11 children in that family, and the most garden-obsessed child was named Jimmy. So these could have been called Kevin Nardellos if I was in that family, because you know, out of 11, I would have been the most garden-obsessed. Maybe one day in the future, I'll have one. But this is a classic Italian frying pepper. It is very prolific. You can use it, as I said, fresh or fried, but you can also dry it up in the rafters and then smoke it and grind it or just grind it and you'll have paprika because grinding up a dried sweet pepper is the way that you get paprika. Now the only other thing I wanna tell you on this is peppers like a little bit of heat when they are germinating. So I have this little seed starting tray over here and what I like to do is put a heat mat underneath even if I'm growing indoors because peppers wanna germinate upwards of that 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes they can get up to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit and that really speeds up they're sprouting because peppers do take a bit of time to sprout, 10 days, maybe 20 days to get a nice little seedling going. But starting these early really, really helps because they take a while to mature. So when you finally get them in the ground, when you can 
actually work that ground, you're in a good spot. I really love it when you can grow something that you can use all the parts of. Echinacea or cone flower are one of those plants. It's not only beautiful to look at, but the flower, stem, leaves, and roots can all be used in some way. For herbal remedies, you want to look for the purple cone flower or the Echinacea purpurea. These are also native to North America and as a perennial in zones three through eight. So if you start these beauties indoors, you're likely going to get blooms in the first year. I'm planting my Echinacea seeds out in these six cell seed trays. And once they are about an inch tall, I'm going to pick the strongest seedling and continue growing these on. These can be a little bit slow to start, sometimes up to a month. So be patient because it will happen. For this next pick, we're going to do a little bit of chaos gardening because it is finally time to start doing that with some spring veggies here in zone 8A. And if you follow me, you know that that's like my favorite thing to do in the garden, especially with a dynamic duo like carrots and radish. A really common question I get asked about chaos gardening is do I have to go and thin those seedlings after they start to sprout? And yeah, you do. Pretty much always you should be thinning because you've got to give those plants room to grow. But I'm going to show you guys a little trick with planting the carrots and radish together and that really, really helps with that task of thinning. So here's what I like to do. I like to mix both carrot and radish seeds into an old herb shaker or something like that, preferably one with the bigger holes at the top like this. And I like to just have fun with it, take this out in the garden with me, sprinkle it into a designated garden area or if you're like me, just kind of chaotically sprinkle it around anywhere you can find a space and then lightly rake those seeds through the soil and water well. So the trick is that most radish varieties like this beautiful Easter egg blend, they only take about 30 days from seed to harvest. Whereas most carrot varieties like this Shin Kuroda carrot, which is my absolute favorite carrot variety ever, by the way, they can take upwards of like three, maybe even four weeks to start germinating and sprouting. So when you're planting them together like this, you have your radish growing in between those carrots. And by the time the carrots even start to sprout, the radishes are already ready to harvest. And when you harvest those radishes, it's making lots of room for the carrots to grow. It's aerating the soil. It's loosening up the soil, which the carrots really appreciate because carrots love a good loose soil in order to form properly. And most importantly, it's making your life a lot easier by not having to thin as much. No cottage garden would be complete without this plant. And I literally have the words cottage garden in my username. So I kind of have to grow it, right? And the plant that I'm talking about is the beautiful, fragrant sweet pea. They're literally the best smelling plant ever. If you pick them and put them in a room, they'll fill up the whole room with their scent. They're also great for adding height to your garden because you can train them up structures like teepees and arches. They're a real standout plant. Sweet peas love to be grown in deep pots. So I'm sowing mine into these root trainers to give their roots lots of room to grow nice and deep. But you could also grow them in a normal pot like this. I'd sow three to a pot this size. And then when they're ready to plant out, just plant out the whole thing. Some people like to nick the seeds with a knife or even soak them in water to try and speed up germination. But I always have perfect germination without doing any of these things. So I don't think it's necessary at all. Just make sure you keep the compost nice and damp and you should be completely fine. I'm sowing the seeds individually about a centimeter deep or just under half an inch. The ideal temperature for sweet peas to grow is around 13 to 18 degrees Celsius or about 55 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So they should be pretty happy in a cool area of my house. I'm gonna leave them there until they've germinated, keep them nice and damp. And then once they've started to germinate, I'm gonna bring them out into the greenhouse so they can continue to grow with a little bit of extra protection from the frost. One of the main reasons I got a garden in the first place is because I love to cook. And if there's one single thing that has the biggest impact on your kitchen, not just in terms of flavor, but of how much value you get out of it, it's definitely herbs. Now, a lot of herbs you could easily get at the grocery store, such as this parsley, but there are some herbs that are a little bit harder to find at the grocery store and also a little bit harder to grow. Like take this winter savory, I've got a special tip for you to ensure that it germinates every single time. When you read the back of any of your seed packets, there'll generally be a special tip. In this case, it says special germination instructions, light necessary for germination. So the way we get around that is that we take our seed pack like so. I'm gonna go ahead and sprinkle a couple extra because whenever you have a more challenging seed, it's just, in my opinion, always better to put more than you think you need because there's a good chance that not all of them are gonna make it. So here we go. I've probably got about 10 seeds in each one of these cells. Now the next thing you're gonna do is very simple. Take your finger. You're simply going to press those seeds 
right into that soil surface. Instead of burying them with more soil, which will block the light, by pressing them in, we're ensuring that that moisture contact is going to be there with the seed. And you can even mist this over with like the mist setting on the hose, and that'll be plenty. Just make sure you keep the top consistently moist with the mister, and you should have good germination every single time. Dulce basil or holy basil is one of my garden staples and can, can be used in the kitchen, medicinally, in tea, and as dye. So I plant out plenty of these and you can actually keep them as an indoor plant if you want to have them year round. Dulce basil has a totally different scent than other basil. It smells a little bit like bubble gum kind of, but once you smell it, you won't forget it. Like most basils, these are going to be annuals. For my Dulce basil or holy basil, I'm going to also be using the six cell tree trays and then I'm going to put two seeds per cell. Once they're about two inches tall, I will prick them out and plant them on into probably the four cells so they can get a little bit bigger. These germinate pretty quickly, about five to ten days. Adding on these domes really helps keep the heat and humidity in on your seed trays, creating a perfect environment for your seeds to germinate. You'll also want to label and date everything, include the variety as well. I always forget to say straw flower, pink, whatever, and then I don't know what it is I'm growing. You'll also want to pick up a seed tray like this because you're going to want to water from the bottom, and that is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to fill the seed tray with water rather than watering from above because this is the best way to make sure that your seeds don't get displaced. And don't water on a schedule. Look at your soil and see if it's dry and then bottom water. It's the best way to keep your plants healthy. So my next crop is actually not the one I'm fixing up right now, which are peas, which are good to start right now. It's actually one that most people try to start in the summer because they associate it with some of these classic summer foods like salsas or guacamole or on top of tacos or in all sorts of different dishes from really around the world. The problem is this plant does not really like to grow in summer and of course I am talking about the persnickety cilantro. Cilantro, which is the plant that wants to grow when you do not want to eat it and when you want to eat it, it's harder to grow. And the reason why is because cilantro does something called bolting. Every plant does it. In fact, you can see some of the plants in this garden are already starting to. And what that means is it wants to go up and start a flower stalk and start developing some seeds in the summer when it gets too hot because it doesn't like the heat. So if that happens, two things. First of all, celebrate because you just grew something called coriander. That is the name of the seed. It's also used, of course, as a culinary spice, but you can also grow some varieties that work really well. So long standing Santo, as the name implies, is a good one. It kind of stands in that leafy stage for longer, but you can also just grow it in this month of February or March or April and use it in different sort of preparations. Maybe you want to have some tacos. Maybe you want to do like a little bit of a salsa thing. It's just a really great plant. And I think most people tend to grow it when it doesn't do well. So back it up and grow cilantro in spring. You'll have a much better time. For a full guide on it, check this video out right here. Good luck in the garden, my friends, and keep on growing.